basically this is a, a workshop to discuss the interaction between plants and human beings, uh, specifically the psychological and mental interpenetration of these two very different kinds of life forms. Uh, I think of this uh, course as plants and mind, and uh, the way I like to teach is to just begin to lay out the basic pieces of what is a very complex interdisciplinary puzzle, and hopefully at some point, uh, your specialties, your passions, your interests will ignite the whole thing and it will have then a dynamic of its own. We could discuss these matters for two days, five days, ten days, or as I've done for about 40 years, 35 years. Uh, there is no end to it. And very few areas of human endeavor dissolve the disciplinary boundaries of Western academia as thoroughly as uh, the study of human and psychoactive plant interactions do. There are important issues here in biology and botany, in biogeography, in ethnography and ethnology, in psychology and neurophysiology, in the study of uh, symbols, uh, uh, the, the number of disciplines that have to be brought to bear on this subject is, I think, a central clue to how important it is to uh, understanding our, our humanness. And I represent uh, a radical point of view on these matters. And I don't imagine I was invited here to dumb it down. So, you know, if you had Darwin, you'd get natural selection. If you had Freud, you'd get sexual repression. So you've got McKenna. So you're going to get uh, psychoactive catalysis of consciousness. Uh, because that's basically why I think these ideas are so important. But before we get to that, let me just lay out some of the, the field. Human beings began uh, their career, well, we can trace it back to the primordial slime, I suppose, but uh, our, our animal career be was a career of insectivorous vegetarian and fruititarianism lived out in the arboreal canopies of tropical rainforests. And all, uh, all animal species, indeed all life, tends to, uh, occupy an evolutionary niche and then stabilize itself in that niche. Uh, termites, cockroaches, these sorts of organisms found their niche hundreds of millions of years ago and filled it to perfection and have occupied it ever since. Generally, Nature is not progressive in its particulars. Overall, nature is progressive, but its particulars uh, seek equilibrium. And so it would have been in the case of our primate ancestors. They achieved uh, a dynamical balance, as I said, a diet of insects and fruit, a canopy habitat, uh, 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 language of pack signaling designed to convey danger and uh, information about food sources and so forth and so on. And there they would have remained uh, had it not been for the larger ecodynamics of the planet, ecodynamics which are still shaping uh, uh, human habitat in Africa. Because what has been going on in Africa for at least five million years is a slow drying of the continent. And it disrupted this uh, rainforest ecology so that about two to four million years ago, I mean, these are vast spans of time we're talking about, the rainforest began to island itself and to be restricted to the wetter 
areas of Africa and into the new environment, the more xerophytic or arid environment that was coming into being, uh, a very diminished plant community took hold, a community of uh, opportunistic grasses, uh, annuals, heavy cedars, this sort of thing. Now we know that the rainforest was primary because the rainforest, <clears throat> just to give you a broad notion, might consist of uh, over a hundred thousand plant species. The grassland ecosystem might well consist of under 500 species. And all 500 grassland species can be found as rare members of the flora of the rainforest. So clearly what we have are the survivors of a process of clearing. And there is argument among botanists about this, but Carl Sauer, who was a great geographer and thinker on these matters, held that there is no such thing as a natural grassland, that grasslands are the early ar earliest artifacts of human impact on the planet. Grasslands are created by burning. Uh, uh, they promote uh, the growth of cereals uh, and, and so play a feed in to the human uh, uh, food chain. So, our uh, primate ancestors' ecological adaptation to arboreal life was interrupted by this process. Uh, and key to my thinking about all this, and those of you who are going to have careers in all this, I hope some of you will take it up and adumbrate it. I think the great overlooked factor in any model of human evolution, and indeed in uh, evolutionary models of many other species is we have not given enough uh, emphasis to diet. When we talk about natural selection of an animal species, we tend to think uh, that uh, the genome expresses a physical type and the phenotype is then subject to selection by natural environment. Some biologists have the, the thinness of this understanding. L.L. L. White wrote a book called Internal Factors in Evolution in which he pointed out that the womb is itself an environment that makes a very heavy selection before an organism is ever born into the theater of Darwinian selection. So it isn't a tabla rasa that you're born into the theater of natural selection. You have been subject to natural selection from the very earliest moments of the existence of the zygote. Uh, so that's one factor. Uh, but what I have emphasized is diet. Diet is uh, an input of potentially mutagenic factors into the body that can have enormous consequences uh, on the health of an individual or the general evolution uh, of a population. And I've used the, the toolbox of ideas that I'm going to put forward here today and tomorrow to try and address what seems to me to be one of the most centrally interesting questions uh, to be asked of this world, and that is, what is human consciousness? Where did it come from? And why does it exist at all? Uh, and I believe that we can, by thinking about psychoactive plants, diet, and the early human evolutionary situation, we can make a lot of progress uh, on this question. And we can illuminate some of our political dilemmas that persist to this day the gender friction uh, that typifies human society, the hierarchy structures and the tensions they create, so forth and so on. So let me run through this and get it off my chest, and then we can talk about the larger uh, uh, materia medica of, of, uh, of psychoactive change relative to 
to plants. As the rainforest retreated, our remote primate ancestors came under nutritional pressure, obviously, because their area for gathering food was being physically diminished. Now, when a, uh, as you probably know or have observed, most animal species are very particular about their food intake. And if you've ever tried to, tried to raise butterflies or something for your children, uh, you know that if you capture a caterpillar in the wild, but don't pay close attention to the plant you find it on, you can't just put grass in a peanut butter jar with a caterpillar and expect great success. Animals are highly specialized in, in their choice of foods. Why is this? Well, as near as we can tell, uh, eating all kinds of foods from an evolutionary point of view is a very reckless move indeed, because plants represent um, uh, chemical smorgasbords of various types that have accumulated over time in the genome of a particular organism. If you have a very broad-based diet, you are exposing yourself to many different kinds of mutagenic influences. As a strategy for survival of a species, this is not good. Uh, much better to specialize, to evolve special enzymatic pathways to deal with toxins. So, for instance, we know certain animals can eat things that other animals would become ill from or even die. Uh, and this is the way it's done. And all animal species tend to evolve toward these very bland uh, mono diets. Now, what happens when uh, there is an upheaval in an environment, uh, a geomagnetic reversal, a volcanic eruption, a drought, something like that, and ordinary sources of nutrition become restricted? Then an organism has basically two choices. It can uh, go extinct, starve itself out of existence, or if it has more flexible behaviors, it can begin to experiment with previously rejected potential foods in the environment. Rejected probably because of uh, strong taste or something like that, which are clues to the presence of marginally acceptable chemical compounds of some sort. Our remote canopy living ancestors, as I mentioned, were fruititarian insectivores. They, under nutritional pressure, began to expand their repertoire of foods. They also began to explore the grassland environment. And I mentioned that the grassland environment is much poorer in, in total number of plant species than the rainforest. Thus, and logically, the potential number of, of food sources is also limited. Baboons and chimpanzees will dig with sticks for the corms, the swollen roots of grasses. Uh, so as our remote ancestors began to explore this new environment of the grasslands, they also began to explore new dietary items. Uh, and one of the items that they would surely have uh, observed are coprophytic mushrooms, mushrooms which prefer dung as their environment. Coprophilic or coprophytic is the word for this. Many of these species of coprophytic mushrooms elaborate psilocybin, which, as I assume you know, is uh, one of the major psychoactive alkaloids. Uh, psilocybin occurs in many species of mushroom. It's unknown outside of the, the fungi. Uh, and, but I maintain that, in a sense, psilocybin is the, uh, is the best model for human interaction with a psychedelic, or that all other psychoactive plant usages are an effort to duplicate, return to, or somehow evoke 
the original human relationship uh, to psilocybin. And here is uh, this, and, and it is not simply its psychoactive properties that makes psilocybin a potential catalyst for human consciousness. It is its psychoactive properties in combination with certain other properties that make it uh, uniquely suited to carry out the role of, cata of catalysis of consciousness in a higher animal. What are these unique characteristics? Well, first of all, uh, in very low doses, psilocybin uh, increases visual acuity. If you want to go back into the literature, Roland Fisher, uh, in the middle 60s, uh, took graduate students and gave them small amounts of psilocybin or placebo, and he built an apparatus where two parallel strips of metal could be deformed uh, by winding a crank. And he asked people to uh, uh, push a button when the two strips seem to them to cease to be parallel. And he demonstrated that edge detection is enhanced by small amounts of psilocybin. Well, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to realize that edge detection is at a very high premium in any grassland situation where predation is taking place. The, the lion moving in the grass 300 yards away as it creeps upon your camp, or the gazelle trying to slip away through the tall grass from your hunting party. Edge detection is the key to success or failure in hunting in that kind of a situation. And uh, it's extraordinary uh, that uh, we can statistically demonstrate this improved visual acuity occurring uh, in the presence of psilocybin. What it would have done, you see, is these protohominids who would accept the psilocybin into their diet would have a slightly enhanced success in hunting. That slightly enhanced hunting success would mean more nutritional resources available for them and their offspring, offspring presumably inculcated into the habit of also eating the mushrooms. So what we have here is a slight favoring then of those animals in the population that would accept psilocybin into the diet. Uh, at slightly higher levels, Psilocybin is, uh, like all CNS stimulants, uh, causes arousal. And arousal is simply a feeling of unfocused restlessness. You know, it's that too espresso feeling. Uh, sleep is impossible. Hands are busy at small tasks. So one is aware of one's sphere of awareness extends out somewhat further. Uh, and in highly sexed animals like primates, arousal means erection in the male. And this is very important for this theory because we not only have to account for human consciousness, but we have to account for the peculiar dislocation that human consciousness seems to carry with it, that we are both of nature yet not of nature, somehow creatures with one foot in nature and one foot in heaven, and how does this uh, come about? Uh, I believe, and I'm you know, willing to argue it against all comers, that a key element to understanding our, soci our sociology and our sexual politics and all that is to realize that psilocybin had two effects in the early human populations that were using it. One, we're very familiar with if we're psychedelic sophisticates ourselves. It's the psychedelic experience, the boundary dissolving, hallucinatory, shamanic uh, apotheosis that occurs with psilocybin. But the other effect is to uh, medicate the tendency to form dominance hierarchies. 
And this is very controversial. In other words, what I'm saying is that all primates form dominance hierarchies. And what that means, just to remind you, is that the hard-bodied, long-fanged young males take control of the group. They control the children, the women. They order the old, the homosexual, and the young. Everybody is under their thumb. And uh, part of our dilemma as a global society is that though we claim great sophistication, we still live under male dominance hierarchies. Corporations, universities, family structures, you know, long-fanged males are still ordering around the elderly, the weak, and the female among us. And it is, and as we are conscious beings and reflect upon this, it creates great social dislocation and political unhappiness and tension in relationships and so forth and so on. I believe that our unique position in the animal world arose as a consequence of a chemical suppression of a natural behavior pattern. The pattern of male dominance, of forming dominance hierarchies, was interrupted by an item in the diet, psilocybin. And into this chaos, this egalitarian chaos, which resulted, was a, a situation in which everything about us that we treasure and hold up as human was put in place. In other words, theater, language, dance, story, altruism, ethics, uh, metaphysics, did I say poetry? Everything that makes us human came into being roughly a hundred thousand in the last well, from 100,000 to about 15,000 years ago, people lived in balance with the earth, with the larger biome in which they were embedded. Uh, uh, there was not product fetishism ushering into enormous toxic uh, uh, processes involving the smelting of metals or the extraction of rare elements from the earth. Uh, now, you could object and say, well, but they just simply weren't sophisticated enough to do those things. I maintain that our technical sophistication is a very specialized form of cultural adaptation and that comparing us and finding us favorably compared to the civilization of Homer or Chattalhyuk or Altamira is, is simply a form of cultural chauvinism. Okay. But psilocybin had other effects besides this suppression of male dominance that I mentioned and this increased sexual thing, which I did mention, but I didn't draw the correct conclusion there. If you have a, uh, something in your food, which is, to put it crudely, acting as an aphrodisiac, then it is reasonable to expect that you will have more pregnancies and reasonable to expect that you will therefore have uh, again, a tendency to outbreed the non-psilocybin-using members of the population. So we have two factors here. Increased visual acuity, which gives greater uh, food-gathering uh, capacity. Increased sexual activity, which tends to outbreed uh, the non-psilocybin-imbibing uh, members of the group. And then, on top of all this, you have this ecstatic internal state for which we, with all our cultural and epistemic sophistication, are still unable to come to terms. The mystery of the psychedelic uh, experience. Now, these things taken together with other factors working in parallel created, I think, the dilemma and the glory and the opportunity of humanness. Once we began, under nutritional pressure, to expand our diet, we were delicately poised on the edge of omnivorousness. 
Because recall in the canopy situation, we were insectivores, our remote ancestors. We were not simply vegetarians. We were insectivores. In the grassland environment, we began probably to, uh, originally to uh, follow along behind lion kills and that sort of thing and eat carrion. One evolutionary theory says that our suppressed olfactory apparatus, the fact that we have a very limited sense of smell, is because there was a period in our evolution when we did a lot of rooting around in carcasses. This is not the noble image uh, we might have wished, but uh, there it is. If you need a countervailing theory, because you don't like that one, the other theory is, no, we lost our sense of smell because when we stood upright, we got our faces up off the ground, and that's where the smells are anyway, so it all sort of became useless equipment, uh, and we dropped it. A point that I've become convinced of in the last couple of years but is definitely not PC is that I've noticed, and my attention was called to it by Philippe de Vaugelay, who's a friend of mine, uh, carnivores are the most conscious of animals. Cows have very little interest in the habits of chipmunks or birds or anything else. All they do is munch grass. Carnivores, on the other hand, have an acute interest in the behavior of other animals. And in fact, I'm on the brink of willing to argue that the earliest consciousness was not self-consciousness. It was consciousness of how dinner thought. Because if you can think like your dinner. You can go out and plant yourself in its path of behavior and have dinner. You see, and if you will, if you will look at the difference between, a, oh, I don't know, a gerbil and a house cat, uh, the intelligence level is striking. And I think that that this attention to the behavior of other animals on the part of, of an emerging habit of carnivorous behavior is going to have to be taken into consideration. Um, it's interesting that shamanism, which is in a sense the earliest intellectual pursuit, emerges in its early phase as a technique for identifying with animals, hunting magic is what we're talking about here. And so I think that there is was a very interesting mix of factors and players in the early human evolutionary situation. First of all, a canopy-dwelling primate with a pack signaling repertoire is forced into a grassland environment uh, where psilocybin mushrooms occur where small and large animals are predating upon each other and where nutritional options are highly restricted. And as, the, as this animal makes its adaptive choices, it moves deeper and deeper into the realm of mind. First, the modeling of the behaviors of other animals and the behaviors of plants, because in a hunting-gathering situation, when plants produce fruit, what environments they prefer, what other plants they grow in association with, what soil types they prefer, all of these things are cofactors feeding in to an image of the world. And this image of the world, by its accuracy or falsity, decrees life or death upon those uh, uh, who carry it. Uh, the omnivorousness forced us into an awareness of other animals. That made us, uh, that put us on the level of intelligence of a hunting cat or something like that. But the psilocybin experience at higher doses and obviously by this time inculcated for sexual and ritual and hunting purposes into the society also impels you into a non-local 
invisible, magical world that is, to use a Jungian term, highly numinous, highly charged with the energy of the archetype, of the archetypal world. And, as I said, to this day, we are not able to come to terms with this. No matter how much Derrida or Husserl or Wittgenstein you've imbibed, it still is a very challenging thing to dissolve your ordinary state of consciousness and abandon yourself to the dynamic of the larger mind that we find ourselves embedded in. For a long time, therefore, up, let's say, I mean, numbers are numbers, but let's say from 50,000 years ago to 12,000 years ago, there was a kind of paradise on this planet. Poetry coexisted with uh, uh, a balanced ecosystem. Uh, observational sciences, astronomy, botany, biology, taxonomy, the observational sciences, coexisted with the natural world. And then, the same factors which created this Edenic situation, which remember what they were, it was the drying of the African continent that caused the rainforest retreat. That same process had been going on, slowly, inevitably, endlessly, and about between, well, after the last glacial melt, which began 20 to 17,000 years ago, Africa went dramatically dry. And the Sahara Desert began to form, where there had been a vast grassland dotted by sandstone pinnacles, cut by rushing streams, and crowded with uh, vast herds of game. And that was the theater of human emergence. But when it began to go dry, it went dry rather dramatically. These ice cores coming out of Iceland make this clear. Nevertheless, as late as Roman times, the Roman historian Pliny referred to North Africa as the breadbasket of Rome because they were growing wheat in vast amounts in North Africa as recently as 2,000 years ago in areas now where there is nothing. Well, uh, the, this paradisical African psilocybin matriarchal partnership a psychedelic, shamanic, archaic, whatever you want to call it, society was then pushed into crisis. And a number of things happened. First of all, migrations of people out of Africa. Uh, this happens every time there's a glacial melt. Human populations were trapped or proto-hominid populations get trapped during the glacials because the last glacial period the glaciers came as far south as, uh, as northern Israel. Uh, so human populations get trapped, and then in the interglacials during the melts, they radiate outward. Uh, people began leaving the Sahara, settling in the Nile Valley, and the use, this shamanic use of psilocybin was disrupted because the environment which made it possible was disrupted. And when that happened, and this I'm closing the loop here for you, few of my raps are so sustained, <laughs> when, when that happened, the pattern of male dominance, the pattern that was genetically never removed, but which had been pharmacologically suppressed for over a hundred thousand years perhaps, reasserted itself with a vengeance it was always there. It had never been bred out. And it must have been an era of enormous brutality when people's sense of things was that people were turning bad. Suddenly, we get uh, a whole bunch of things come at once. Uh, an end to nomadism. The beginnings of sedentary agriculture. City building. Uh, standing armies, slavery, male kingship, dominance, all of these things appear just almost overnight. They spring up. 
And I maintain they are what a monkey would build as a civilization if suddenly all of its worst behavioral tendencies came to the forefront with a vengeance. And that's precisely what happened. In the period when we were self-medicating ourselves with psilocybin, we passed from being an animal into being the peculiarly spiritual entity that we are. We elaborated observational techniques, uh, theories of magic, language. But when the psilocybin was withdrawn, these tools, which had been our glory, became instead our curse. Because instead of using them to produce theater and dance and ecstatic social interaction, we began to use them to support the new and older agenda of male dominance. And it's a frightening thing, you know, to think. People following their cattle across the African plain, uh, eating the mushrooms, seeing the mushrooms as part of the output of the cattle in the same way that meat and milk and manure were output of the cattle. A mother goddess religion, a religion of the land that moves lightly over the soil, uh, no evidence of, of intergroup conflict, so forth and so on. And somehow, then, this process, which took a long time of domesticating cattle, because I'm sure you see, you can see how it all worked, how these factors were disparate, and then they flowed together. Human beings followed cattle because they were following uh, kills of lions. Uh, you follow the cattle in the same way that the jackals follow the cattle to deal with the lion kills made by large predators. Well then, you, in the course of this, you encounter uh, weakened animals or abandoned uh, infant animals and you care for them and over 20,000 years, this turns into domestication of animals, husbandry of cattle. But uh, you take away the psilocybin, and I, I think this is a frightening thing to contemplate. The earliest cities, I will argue, were pens for human beings. That's what a city is. It's a pen for human beings. Some of these dominant males said, well, we control cattle. Why shouldn't we control human beings in the same way? Why shouldn't a king order his people in with the same impunity that he orders the slaughter and the movement of herds of goats and cattle? And all of the institutions that we labor under came into being at this moment of transition from the late Neolithic, or, or from the Paleolithic to the Neolithic, to the agricultural uh, situation. The reason for this, I believe, can be traced to evo the evolution of consciousness. I mean, consciousness is a double-edged sword. Uh, at the very, m one of the factors, I think, that contributed to the re-emergence of male dominance was that at some point, human intellectual capacity reached the point where a distant cause could be connected to an effect and the effect and cause that were being observed was uh, the sex act. At some point, men and women presumably, but men must have understood that an act of copulation, if carried out successfully and in the right rhythm to the moon, will result in a child nine months later. If you don't have that understanding, you have no sense of male paternity. So you have a very tight social bond because for men, the children are our children, the children of the group. Once you have a sense of male paternity, then you have ownership. And this then uh, becomes very problematic. At the very moment that men were figuring this out, women were noticing that in the yearly round of following the cattle, 
when they would return to the kitchen middens and fire pits abandoned a year previously, that there would be food in those areas, an abundance of food plants from cast off kernels of cereals and so forth and so on. So then there is this awareness. If we bury food, if we bury food sources, then food will come out of the ground. The problem with agriculture in the early phase is that it's hideously efficient. And what it does is it immediately creates uh, such a surplus that you have to stop moving. Nomadism has to be abandoned. You till fields and you overproduce and then you must store and defend your overproduction against less fortunate human groups in the area. The most advanced building on this planet in 10,000, uh, 8,000 BC was uh, the grain tower at Jericho. And what was it? It was a grain storage tower and it had a staircase so that you could carry large rocks up onto the parapet so that you could drop them onto the heads of enemies who were trying to batter their way into your grain tower. So I, I spent some time on this because uh, this could be taught, this course, uh, without any reference to our contemporary dilemma, which is, the, uh, and by that dilemma I mean the dilemma of gender difference, male dominance, underutilization of females in society, underutilization of feminine points of view in society. But obviously there is a lot of tension in our society around the issue of psychedelic intoxication, around the issue of these shamanic plants, though there is a growing awareness among sophisticated people that the case is almost entirely emotional. In other words, we tolerate outlandishly toxic drugs, alcohol, tobacco, uh, we're willing to make a trade-off of uh, 70,000 deaths a year in this country for the privilege of driving the automobile, so forth and so on. We tolerate very toxic practices if they are seen to be somehow uh, supportive of the agenda being handed down from the top. Psychedelics are not, and they are seen as tremendously disruptive, and yet, as the ethnographic and uh, pharmacological data comes in, they are among the most benign uh, uh, substances in the world, and uh, their history of human usage is almost universal. And then the question is, do these intoxications limit the spectrum of consciousness and allow hierarchical models to be handed down and brainwashed into the doubters? Or do these states of consciousness dissolve cultural assumptions and cast the individual into a, an ocean of existential perplexity out of which they have to build uh, their own model of how the world works? Well, uh, I believe the reason for this tension in our society and anxiety and suppression, furious suppression of these things, is because we sense that this addresses origins in the same way that it took a long time to overcome our, our queasiness about discussing sexuality. There's something about the origin subjects that make us very, very uh, nervous. Okay, so that's a very linear discussion of the role of one psychoactive plant in human history, psilocybin. And as I say, I think it was uniquely chemically, botanically uh, positioned to play the, uh, that role in human consciousness. Uh, now, the contemporary situation worldwide is that we find uh, many forms of shamanism from the Arctic to the rainforest to tropics and shamanism always depends for its uh, efficacy on a dislocation 
or a transformation of ordinary consciousness. And we see this achieved in many different ways, uh, through fasting, through ordeal, meaning abandonment in the wilderness or, or flagellation, uh, through uh, elaborate theatrical effects, special effects, uh, through the use of, of substances in plants. And there has been a controversy in anthropology never resolved uh, over the past 40 years. Uh, what is the authentic shamanism? And those of you who are anthropologists know that uh, Merciliad, who was one of the great uh, experts in this field, claimed he called use of plants in a shamanic context decadent. He called these, the use of such plants narcotic. Well, first of all, the use of the word narcotic in that context shows you don't know what you're talking about in terms of pharmacology. That's a totally obsolete and silly category and not true to boot. Psychedelics are in no sense narcotic. Uh, Gordon Wasson, on the other hand, who was a, a brilliant amateur and the discoverer of the psilocybin cults in Mexico, uh, along with his partner and wife, Valentina Wasson, took just the opposite position and said, no, use of plants to transform consciousness is the primary method where there are is resort to ordeal, fasting, wilderness abandonment, uh, so forth and so on. This is the derivative, late arriving, decadent shamanism. In fact, this is shamanism on its way to turning into religion of the ordinary sort. And in fact, if we look at religion of the ordinary sort, we see that it does have a place for fasting. It does have a place for self-flagellation. Uh, it, it does have, it does admit those techniques, but no organized religion of any size tolerates the use of psychedelics in consciousness transforming amounts. And that little parenthetical phrase is there because one of the things that you should know and remember and keep always in front of you is that if you wish to control someone or if you want to brainwash somebody, the way you do it is with small amounts of drugs and large amounts of your message, whatever it is. So, uh, you know, but, but if you give people large amounts of a psychedelic, your message will take its place in the parade of ideas and find its relative importance. Uh, so, so using drugs is, does not mean, if you come upon a cult or a group or an individual using psychedelic substance, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are on a path of spiritual and shamanic transformation. It may be that they just are self-enforcing some private Idaho of illusion in which they choose to live. But if large doses are being taken. And by large, I simply mean effective, full-spectrum doses. One of the wonderful things about these substances is that the effective dose is a long ways away from a dangerous dose. The LB50, in other words, is very favorable. Uh, the boundary dis well, so then let me talk for a minute about the character of this experience generally. What is the plant hallucinogen experience in all times and all places for all people? I mean, I don't know if you can be that general, but it's important to try. What it is, is it's an experience of boundary dissolution. It's an experience of having categories obliterated, of having previously defined boundaries and differences uh, eliminated. The enterprise of being and the enterprise of language is basically an enterprise of defining boundaries. I am myself, 
you are you, this is now, that was then, we are here, they are there. These are provisional uh, distinctions about reality that make it necessary, that are necessary for us to keep track of and manipulate our animal body as a machine uh, in Newtonian space. But when a shaman takes a, a psychoactive plant at an effective dose, he or she falls into trance, becomes immobile. And then the geometry of consciousness, if you wish, is uh, melted and recast in a different geometry. And, and I use these mathematical terms because I really sincerely believe that at some hypothetical future date, when this is all sorted out, what we're going to realize about the psychedelic experience is that it is the experience of the fact of the higher geometry of the universe in which we live. In other words, it's very easy to see that ordinary consciousness uh, evolved to, well, but let me put it this way, it's a wonderful aphorism. Consciousness takes the contours of the vessel into which it is poured. It's like water. It always takes the shape of the vessel into which it is poured. And so what are we? We are, uh, on, on the large scale, uh, we are animals in three-dimensional space given to hunting and given to being hunted. So what has consciousness done? It has evolved into a kind of threat, anticipation, detection, and avoidance uh, machine. The purpose of consciousness, the purpose of your eyes, the coordination of your sensa, is to navigate you through the world without dying without being ripped apart by predators or being caught in landslides or rushing rivers, so forth and so on. And consciousness fills that need, ordinary consciousness, very well. But it, because the body is, uh, has a locus in three-dimensional space, consciousness of the ordinary sort tends to surround the body as an object of concern. In other words, if, if you're worried about tra being hit by traffic, you're not being you're not worried about being hit by traffic in Berkeley. You're worried about being hit in traffic in San Francisco because that's where you happen to be. So consciousness of the ordinary sort tends to cluster around the physical body. But when consciousness is dissolved of that concern and dissolved of the programming in language that that concern has built up over ages, it recrystallizes in a higher dimension, literally a kind of hyperspace. And if you will think for a moment about shamanism, I think you'll see how literally we can take this mathematical metaphor of the psychedelic experience. What is a classic shaman expected to do and be. Well, shamans uh, predict hunting. They see where the game will be. Shamans predict weather. They, they can tell what the weather will be. Uh, shamans are brought in to mediate complex social hassle of the who is sleeping with my woman, who stole the chicken, uh, you know, who shat in the stream kind of social hassle. Shamans are brought in for this, these kinds of purposes. And then finally and most importantly, shamans cure. They cure sometimes. Well, now, these things, predicting the weather, seeing where the game went, uh, curing, and having a deep insight into social interaction, these are things which become completely non-mysterious if we hypothesize that the shaman has a hyperspatial point of view. Uh, 
You know, if you went into a mathematical hyper, if we had a space here and we could go into hyperspace, we would discover that the safe is open, that there is a words are difficult here, but there is a side of the safe, or let's say a dimension to the safe, which isn't locked. In the same way that if a, a hyperspatial entity were looking down on San Francisco, it could reach into this room without coming through the door and rearrange things. In other words, everything that we call magic, seeing the future, seeing into locked boxes, knowing what is going to happen, becomes utterly non-mysterious if you hypothesize that consciousness can unfold itself under this peculiar pharmacodynamic situation into a higher dimensional space. And that becomes important uh, in the modern context more than in the archaic context because the, the collective future has become for us a, a, a focus of major anxiety. We need to know where we're going. You know, Marshall McLuhan said, the way we run our societies is like driving an automobile using only the rear view mirror. Well, in shamanically guided societies, they actually turn on the headlights. Uh, running by the rear view mirror means you, you only have past experience to guide you. Running with the headlights on means you actually have an insight into the forward uh, dimension into what into which you're moving. Okay, so that is sort of a broad sketch of how one plant, psilocybin, may have catalyzed, shaped, impacted human consciousness, how the abandonment of that archaic shamanic style through climatic change created the fall into history, how the fall into history is the absence of this hyperdimensional point of view, and then what we'll talk about when we come back after the break is how can we utilize the botanical and ethnographic and pharmacological data that we have garnered in the last hundred years to recapture, revivify, and explore this dimension of human potential in such a way that we can actually inject uh, some hope into our political circumstances. I don't believe if we remain as we are, half angel, half monkey, ruled by dominant hierarchies, ruled by the most ruthless among us, that we have much of a future on the evolutionary stage. But, but I think that if we can recapture the lost symbiosis with these psychoactive plants, that we will, in fact, be recovering a lost portion of ourselves, that history is a progressive dehumanizing of the human experience, and we have now, in the 20th century, reached the level of dehumanizing where you've got the Holocaust, the thermal potential thermonuclear war, Bosnia, Rwanda, you name it. I mean, the scale of brutality, brutalness, bruteness in the 20th century indicates to me that the struggle for the soul of humanity is reaching... Uh, an incredibly intense uh, crescendo. And uh, I, I really believe that the path forward is backward, that we need an archaic revival, and that central to that revival will be the personality and the technology of shamanism. And when we analyze that technology for its effectiveness, we will discover that the most interesting things in the shamanic toolbox are... Uh, the plants which directly intervene in the functioning of human consciousness. So let's just take a stand-up five-minute break.